how can we as a community, right? Because we're talking about community. We talk about the widespread, but it's really about community. How can we begin to like unpack those instances? Because those on one end, again, that was something done to us, but then it was someone of us who helped to halt that. How can we begin to unpack that and get past those things in order for us to be able to, I guess, I would be, honest, be able to trust a lot of the process? So I think it's important, right? So there's a couple of things here. And yeah. I mean, this topic alone, we could talk about for hours. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, I think it's important to note that, you know, it has happened, right? Like these, we, we're not talking, we're not ignorant in stating that we have been held victim to um, mistreatment within our health system. There's, there's no myth there that's proven. It's mm -hmm. been proven through Tuskegee. It's also been proven Henrietta Lacks. It's also been proven through, I mean, if we're going to go back all the way back to, um, you know, our, the health of slaves. Uh, I mean, it's been systemic since the beginning, um, mm -hmm. since we were known as people. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no, there's no denial there that this has happened and that it, it it has continued to show itself to be a prominent part of history. I think that what you, the way that you phrase the question is very important. It's, it happened to us, but how do we interact with it and move forward without our interactions just re-implementing and re causing for the repetition of history? Because mm -hmm. there's the side of the system uh, putting forth that repetition, but then there's also how we interact with the system that further perpetuates those disparities. Greetings, family. This is Kyle Dixon, co-founder of Precise Minds Filmworks, educator for 20 plus years, cultural enthusiast. And I'm Kai Day Bentley, president and founder of Four T's Teaching Teens to Think, whose mission is to help inner city youth identify their inherent skill sets in order to complete their education, establish a career, and ultimately start a business if they choose to. Professor at Fordham University, where I teach students who are pursuing their master's degree in social justice. And with that said, welcome to the Grand Rising Collective, a podcast whose purpose is to cultivate greatness and excellence within ourselves and our communities. The name itself is from the morning greeting of Grand Rising, which we interpret as starting off the day with a greatness mindset so that we are able to rise to the occasion of whatever obstacles and challenges we may face. And that's why we focus on engagement relevant information and empowerment for people in our communities who want to be and do better in their daily lives. Welcome to the Grand Rising Collective. Welcome, 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 welcome. All right, glad to see you all in the in the building, as they say, you know, on the on the live stream here. Uh, but welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Greetings, family. This is Kyle Dixon here, your co-host, for the Grand Rise Collective podcast, right? So we have a special event for you today, all right? Uh, this is a, a colleague of mine uh, I met some time ago in New York City, all right? So we have Dr. Brooke E. Wyatt here for you all today to speak with us, to speak with y'all, all right, about what's going on in this world, dealing with the COVID, the Delta variant, uh, the community public health issues that uh, were existing even pre-COVID. Um, but before we go into that, my 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 my, my partner in podcast, co-host Kyle Bentley, how you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you so much, Kyle. Getting on me regarding feedback on my audio. So, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry if you're hearing feedback. My apologies. Uh, but <laughs> real talk now, we're, we're, we're honored to have our guest, Dr. Brookie Wyatt. Um, there's some discussions we're going to talk about, which are going to like, but I'm just happy to be here and I'm ready to dive into it. So thank you, Kyle. Appreciate the introduction. Just inform our community and, well, not community, but quote unquote neighborhoods. Just, just, just catch them up and update them and educate them. Indeed. Indeed. And this is all about education for all of us, family, because we're all in this together. Um, so this is all not only about you all being informed, but us as podcasters, as your, your co-hosts being informed as well. And that's what the Grand Rise Collective Podcast is all about. You know, we want to be able to inform, educate, but also really empower ourselves with the information and the um, and the experiences that people, professional folks, people who have the knowledge, have the experience, have the uh, wherewithal and the know-how to give us that insight. So without further ado, Brooke, my sister, how are you doing today? 
I am well. I am well. Thank you so much for having me and uh, inviting me to join you all today. Um, I definitely think that these topics are of grave importance, especially given the landscape we're currently in. Um, I do want to preface, I do have a dog, and at any point, if he starts barking, I apologize. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we're a friendly podcast. <laughs> we, we, we roll with that. Okay. Awesome. All right. So, you know, if you feel free, if you want, you know, you want to have him as your co-host, you know, or he or she, <laughs> you know, bring, bring him on in, you know. Well, he will be right here next to me, so. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, 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 fam, we're gonna hop right into it. So, so, Dr. Wyatt, as I want to call, you know, give you, you know, give you credit where credit is due. Uh, Dr. Wyatt or book, you know, as I know you. Uh, please give us some background info: who you are, how you got into public health, um, and just really the, just that background information so people become more familiar with where you, who you are, who you, where you're coming from. So yeah, so um, as you shared, I my background is in public health. I uh, went to Columbia for undergrad um, and in my time in New York, um, really got to know the landscape of our communities, specifically in Harlem and in Brooklyn and really throughout all of uh, NYC. And um, after leaving Columbia, um, I went on to get my master's in public health at George Washington University. Um, so there, I my concentration was in epidemiology. So I am an epidemiologist by trade. Um, and then after I left George, when I excuse me, when I was in DC, I primarily focused on studies around um, sexually transmittable diseases, specifically those in fact uh, affecting uh, Black women. Um, and so. Leaving George Washington, I moved back to New York um, and upon moving back, started working with Harlem United, uh, which is an HIV AIDS community health organization in Harlem. Um, they actually have sites not just in Harlem, but also in Brooklyn. And I think uh, through my work with HU is how I got introduced to you, Kyle, um, came to uh, CUNY City and uh, spoke to a few of your students one time, and that was definitely a great experience. But through that, I just kind of really started to expand my understanding of uh, the disparities that exist within our communities and looking at the intersectionality of how we as individuals influence those processes as well, you know, contribute to the disparity as well as are affected by it. Um, so uh, through my work at Harlem United, I really um, I was both a uh, program developer as well as implementation specialist, I would say, and then additionally an evaluator. So I had the opportunity to really look at a lot of the programs that were being delivered to um, our communities within the city and to assess whether or not they were um, done with infidelity and essentially were actually achieving the outcomes that we sought to um, in providing resources for our community. So after um, working at Harlem United for a number of years, um, I decided to pursue, excuse me, while working there, I decided to pursue my doctorate in public health at uh, Downstate, SUNY Downstate. And so I, at Downstate, decided to shift away from epidemiology and move more into community health science. Um, and that's really getting it more into where in epidemiology is the study of infectious diseases more so. Um, within my community health science track, I was able to focus more on chronic diseases and actually looking and investigating the implementation of services um, that are provided as well as under better understanding how leadership structure and health organizations um, affects the overall uh, delivery of the healthcare system. Um, so it really allowed for me to get a better full understanding of um, what I like to say is like how to treat a patient holistically. So from mm -hmm. top to bottom as well, bottom to top um, and understanding how to move through big data. So system data and uh, kind of uh, bringing it back down to the individual. So I just, I'm in final stages of, you know, the last edits that they asked you for. So all of those things for your dissertation. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's been a 
long, I guess I've been in the field for about 10 years now, a little over 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I have absorbed a lot <laughs> and I'm, I'm ready to share. <laughs> Wow! <laughs> I tell, as as we always say, family, we don't bring any folks on here that's not about that life. I'm telling you. So tell uh, anything yeah. I'm bringing today, I'm, I'm specifically if I'm speaking, I'll make sure to state whether or not it's facts only, or if it's by opinion. I think that's important. So very important. Very, yes, I don't know. Come on, Cal. What you want me to start with the question? Yes, you seem antsy, man. I, you know, you, uh, you know. I, I nah, think man. I'm still know. processing all that information. <laughs> Jesus. All right. Uh. <laughs> all right. What is the epid? Uh, I'm not even saying it right. Ep epidemiologist. Epidemiologist. What is the epidemiologist, Doctor Brooke? Why do you? Uh, why did you do it? And why is it important in the current COVID crisis? Okay. So. An epidemiologist is a, the study is, well, ep epidemiology is the study of infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. um, so specifically, we're talking about things like COVID. COVID is an infectious disease. Mm -hmm. um, so that is why it's of importance right now. <laughs> it's very interesting. Before 2020, I don't really know if people knew what ep epidemiologists were nor how they existed within our community or where they work, um, how they get jobs. <laughs> I was questioning how we get jobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there really, there really wasn't a good understanding of the science behind epidemiology and what we actually do. But essentially we take large data and we specifically dig into how it affects um, our community. So to share the impact of diseases on vulnerable populations. Um, so some ways that epidemiology has appeared in the past is through the study of HIV. Um, you've also any, honestly, any data that is presented to you on the impact, any incidence, prevalence, um, any of those percentages that you see as far as markers of severity within our communities, hospitalizations, hospital visits, uh, all, literally every piece of data you see from uh, that is coming out of the CDC right now, mm -hmm. most likely epidemiologists, their hands have touched that data. Um, mm -hmm. I actually have the pleasure of knowing uh, someone who works at the CDC when was in my cohort at GW um, and she actually is responsible for all of the map data that we've been seeing. Mm. Um, so it's really good. That's one privilege that I have is to actually know some of the people in my field who are behind the scenes um, working on this data. So mm. it's 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 a bit of, you know, I get to have a little bit more confidence in what I'm seeing because I know the work that my colleagues are doing. Mm. Um, so one thing I did want to share is that, uh, so epidemiologists haven't been around for forever. Um, however, the first black epidemiologist was William Carter Jenkins. Um, mm -hmm. And he attended Morehouse uh, undergrad, Georgetown um, for graduate, as well as UNC Chapel Hill. Um, he, was most famous, he was most famous for halting the Tuskegee uh, experiment in 1969. Mm. Um, so some would ar also argue that Hildreth Augustus Poindexter was the first epidemiologist. Um, and he actually went on to be the president of uh, Powers Medical School. Um, and mm. so, but he actually was a uh, bacteriologist um, that enjoyed the study of epidemiology. So a little bit different. Okay. Um, but it, it, that's just to say that there's history behind this. You know, we we have been here. We have been present in our own um, defense. So I think it's very important to note that an epidemiologist was the first person to stop the Tuskegee experiment. Mm -hmm. um, so just to, just to give you an idea of what side we're on. Mm. And that's important to say, Brooke, that's the school. I didn't I did not know that. See, that's that's good info right there. And. Right, because I know you and I talked, and uh, myself and Kylie have talked as well as amongst other my other peers, and we talk about how you know I talk about how in reference to the Tuskegee experiment, a lot of people use that or 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 state that as far as our distrust 
with some of the medical practices and the medical industry that we as African Americans have faith or have been assaulted with. So from your uh, perspective, uh, Brooke, Dr. Wyatt, how, how can we- You can call me Brooke. You can okay, call Brooke. me Brooke. Okay, cool, Brooke, Brooke, cool. So uh, formal. Right, right, right. But you know, I want to give the sister her, her, her credit where credit's due, you know? Thank like, you, I, mean, I appreciate that, because that oh. doctor was some, some hard iron letters there. Exactly, exactly, and you earned that. So I want to definitely give you your props, you know, and your recognition. Uh, Thank so, you. So, so Brooke, how can we as, a community, right? Because we're talking about community. We talk about the widespread, but it's really about community. How can we begin to like unpack those instances? Because those on one end, again, that was something done to us, but then it was someone of us who helped to halt that. How can we begin to unpack that and get past those things in order for us to be able to, I guess, I would be, honest, be able to trust a lot of the process? So, I think it's important, right? So there's a couple of things here. And yeah. I mean, this topic alone, we could talk about for hours. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, I think it's important to note that, you know, it has happened, right? Like these, we, we're not talking, we're not ignorant in stating that we have been held victim to um, mistreatment within our health system. There's, there's no myth there that's proven. It's been proven through Tuskegee. It's also been proven Henrietta Lacks. It's also been proven through, I mean, if we're going to go back all the way back to, um, you know, our, the health of slaves. Uh, I mean, it's been systemic since the beginning, um, mm -hmm. since we were known as people. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's no, there's no denial there that this has happened and that it, it it has continued to show itself to be a prominent part of history. I think that what you, the way that you phrase the question is very important. It's, it happened to us, but how do we interact with it and move forward without our interactions just re-implementing and re causing for the repetition of history? Because mm -hmm. there's the side of the system uh, putting forth that repetition, but then there's also how we interact with the system that further perpetuates those disparities. So there's there's the the responsibility of the system and then there's responsibility of us as the individuals and how we interact with the system. Mm -hmm. So on the system side of things, I think it's very apparent um, that one, we have been disadvantaged uh, for a very long time, but there is extensive research across industries that have looked into those disparities and continue to document those disparities. I would say that we would be in trouble if the documentation wasn't exist, didn't exist. But the fact that science has continued to investigate where these disparities exist and continue to um, put funding behind uh, ending those disparities. I mean, right now, if you look at any NIH uh, funding, grant funding, I mean, all of it is concentrated on uh, minority communities or what we should be actually referring to the majority community at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. and, and, real, and real quick, uh, NIH, what is that for those? So people? National Institutes, uh, Institute of Health. Okay. So those, that's one of the primary grant funders for either government-based, any government-based funding, um, even CDC grants at this point are primarily focused on the study of, I mean, after we move past just general study of diseases, but how are these diseases expect, uh, affecting minority populations given what we know about our disparities of the past? Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, and this kind of leads into one of the questions that you uh, shared about HIV. How is COVID or the landscape of what we're experiencing right now affecting other infectious or chronic diseases? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's to say that, you know, within, for example, hepatitis, there's an initiative to push for elimination of hepatitis by 2030. This hepatitis is a, this is a disease that affects the liver. Um, and it's actually the reason that I picked this disease to speak to versus HIV is because it's more infectious than HIV. Um, whereas though HIV used to be the epidemic, hepatitis C is now the epidemic. Um, and so that's something that I don't think people are very aware of. 
you know, and it, it also speaks to how we get caught on those buzzwords. Like once once we learn something about one thing, it's hard for us to move past that one thing and expose ourselves to other things. Um, so whereas though people know about HIV predominantly and how it's affected our communities, what we really need to be talking about right now is hepatitis C and how it's ravishing our community right now. Um, because uh, Blacks and Hispanics are uh, definitely of the most infected Hmm. and continue to be of the highest instance in prevalence. Um, and then also our young people are are susceptible to that now simply because of the opioid epidemic that exists. Um, and we're actually starting to see it's expanding beyond just uh, the Blacks and Hispanics, but really also beginning to affect uh, young white people. So that's just one example of how um, when we're looking at diseases and we're looking at how they affect our communities, how we, you know, we, there's, there's, it's, it, disparities exist in everything, but there are initiatives that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis to explore how those disparities are, how we're moving forward. So the fact that there's a 2030 initiative to address uh, the elimination of hepatitis C and that disease primarily affects our population says that there is interest in helping us. There is interest in providing those resources and services to us. Um, and if you actually Google right now, any more recent, I would say uh, after 2019 studies on hepatitis, you'll see that a lot of what the researchers are now saying is like pushing for um, co-location of services, multidisciplinary approach to care simply mm -hmm. because you know, the people who are showing up, primarily us, people of color, um, we're not just there to treat ourselves in a medical setting. We have other things in our lives that uh, influence whether or not we engage with the health system from childcare to the accessibility to um, rapport within the doctor's office to um, housing stability, uh, whether or not you have a, you feel you have a support system outside, you know, outside of the clinic to actually support you through whatever disease or, you know, help trepidations you may be uh, running into. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'll say, so I guess long story short, research is there to support the forward movement of this no long, these disparities no longer existing. However, on the other side, our understanding of that data, our exposure to that information, our willingness to, even though we learned one thing, it, you know, learning new things does not mean that the last thing that we knew about that has to be untrue. Mm. So it's like, you know, we can be cognizant of our past, we can be cognizant of the disparities that have existed within our system, but we don't have to be ignorant to the new knowledge and research that exists to help us move past those past disparities. Mm. 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 Oh, there's, there's a few, there's, wow. Yeah, you, you said a lot. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no apology. I mean, that, that's a good thing. That's a great thing. Uh, that's why we have you on here. And uh, certain things you said, like, like one thing, like hepatitis, right? Like I know there's hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Is there a difference uh, in reference of that? Like, like is there in this yes. so difference? So there's there's uh, there's actually well let me I don't want to say this wrong but I know of hep A through G. Wow, so, I know of G. <laughs> so hepatitis A that's more food viral infection. Hepatitis B that's um, also uh, a viral infection that. Um, interestingly enough, specifically affects more African communities. Mm -hmm. um, and then hepatitis C, which has multiple genotypes. Um, so there's a breakdown within that subgroup and the genotypes affect each populate are more geographically, uh, I guess, represented. So for example, genotype 1A is the most common here within the US um, and then there's hepatitis D, or excuse me, Delta, which is the mo right now is of concern um, because you can be chronically infected with Hep B and Hep D. So, 
Um, and all of these things affect severity of liver disease over time um, and make you more, if you previously were exposed to any hepatitis, form of hepatitis you or excuse me, hepatitis B and C specifically, you're more susceptible to liver cancer. So, okay. but that, yeah, that y'all, I could go. Right. <laughs> um, but that, yeah, that's the difference between those. Uh, quick question. Uh, Ms. Tonette Delk, she asks, can hep C be fatal? Yes, hep C can definitely be fatal. It's actually a silent disease. Um, for it's, You're asymptomatic for, the, for most of your life up until, which is why actually, okay, so the, the populations most affected by hepatitis C are baby boomers, specifically because of uh, intravenous drug use. Um, so those individuals, again, are the most infected as we know currently, because since it's a silent disease, it had time to infiltrate those communities and uh, um, essentially take over as far as, like when we were talking about the transmission of HIV versus Hep C, like mm -hmm. HIV and Hep C were right there together. We just didn't know enough about Hep C to be researching and trying to prevent it up front. Um, and so essentially uh, the, the symptoms actually appear later in life. So it could take 20 years before you actually start to see the symptoms of being hepatitis C positive. Now, if someone were to go the entirety of their life without being tested and they're someone who does not frequent the doctor, um, nine times out of 10, yeah, your the mortality rates associated with hepatitis C are pretty high um, for those individuals. And I'll go on to say that uh, a good portion of our population within the US as well as specifically within NYC are untested and have no knowledge of their status. Um, so yes. Oh, man, that brings, I wanted to ask another question, but now that you brought that up, um, so let me understand this. So I've, I've heard this over the years. So someone could have hep C, but not know they have it. And when we go to the doctor, some people are very astute. My mother was very astute at going to the doctor every year to get a checkup. So that means somebody could have hep C, but if they don't ask the doctor or their physician specifically, can you identify or check if I have hep C? There's no way of identifying it. Or does hep C appear later on in life? So even if they did their research and asked that question early on in life and they tested for hep C, they still wouldn't see it until 20 years later. You understand? No. So you, so if you get tested, you're going to know. Um, so there's, uh, the tests are very sophisticated. Um, and so there's an antibody test that will test if you have ever had any antibodies in your blood, um, which this kind of goes into our conversation about vaccines and mm -hmm. um, antibodies um, versus PCR. So there's an antibody test that tests if it's in your blood. And then there's a PCR test that specifically tells you how much of the virus is in your bloodstream. So that's a viral load test. Um, and so let's say, you know, your mom went to the doctor and she asked, well, first, it's important to note that over time, because we understand knowledge around hepatitis C to for there to be a low health literacy as well as um, understanding of what the disease is, um, the CDC actually moved forward with a mandate for uh, testing for baby boomers. Um, and that was in, I believe, 2013. And mm -hmm. then it went on to, as of this year, most more, or excuse me, March, 2020, they released a mandate for testing of all pa patients 18 years and older. So at least one time. So you, you know, your mom, when she went to the doctor, she's been to the doctor since 2013, which I hope she has. <laughs> <laughs> she would have been offered um, to receive her one time, date, you know, testing. Um, and then after, after that, it's the patient's pri uh, priority as to whether or not they know they are engaging in risky behaviors that would leave them exposed and they should get tested. Um, but at that point, you know, it's so basically, you know how sometimes you go into the doctor's office and they're like, you can opt out of receiving these tests. Mm -hmm. Hepatitis C should be on that test list now. So, so for example, at Mount Sinai, you're going to be tested for hepatitis C unless you opt out. Okay. 
Awesome, awesome. Mm. Uh, I got one more. Now I'm gonna get into it. Now, now All right, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I I get it. I get uh, with regards to disparities that have been documented in regards to the history of uh, the Tuskegee experiment, Henrietta Lacks, and, and all of those natures. In addition to the 2020 initiative to address hepatitis C that affect minority communities, where the health system is paying specific attention on the minority communities, I get that. Um, but my, my question is, it, to, to this day, um, how ha, ha, has racial discrimination played a part in the access of quality and consistent health care in New York City and down south to this very day? Yes, be real. Are they? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the whole reason why I have a job. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> I mean, and now, like, I mean, y'all, we're we're about to blow this whole system, and it's it's yeah, we're about to, we're about to blow. This system. Wow. Okay. And it's it not just up. racial discrimination that's going to do it. It's 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 a lot of. There's a lot of levels. There's systemic levels, there's individual levels, there's community levels, there's education, everything. The intersectionality of all points comes to this question. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll say that I, we, we know that there, we know that racial discrimination was not a prominent part of medical education in the past, correct? Mm -hmm. Like, I think we can all agree. Yes, we can definitely. Can we? Okay, what, what, what we got? No, I'm, 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 I'm gonna let you finish. Go ahead. That it wasn't, that it wasn't that racial, that uh, treating, like that race was not a prominent, like doctors weren't necessarily learning. Right, they weren't learning. Why, the social aspects of why it is they needed to treat, you know, the whole patient in the past. Like they weren't, it was all about okay. the right. basics of science. Okay. It wasn't social science. Public health okay. wasn't incorporated into the medical education until the last decade. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, for the sake of, yeah. I mean, what, what, what we got? <laughs> well, all right. So, nah, not, okay. all right, so. <laughs> no, I need, because I this will establish the, okay. my next point. All right. So, I mean, all right. So, I get it. There, there, I would say, I, I'm a, I'll say 50 50 because. I, there are doctors, I believe, growing up into the history of this country that really love their profession. They really love helping people. They really love, you know, that's their job. They took an oath to help people. So I get that. But I also understand that there's a segment of the health profession that strategically went out of their way to, because we, we talk, if we're going to talk that, we're going to say Henrietta Lacks. They strategically went out their way to not give Henrietta Lacks the process needed of the cells of rejuvenation. If, if, if we're going to do that, then the, the experiment wouldn't have existed where you know, there was some racial discrimination tied into that. Um, so, and then finally, and I know this is going off on tangent, but then you got to look at the whole healthcare system in and of itself. Whereas the healthcare system in and of itself, to this day, got commercials that they're bringing out new drugs almost every week talking about the side effects is this, the side effects is that, take this, take that. And they're giving it to people, making them attack to drugs at it instead of promoting, um, what do you call, natural health. They know about natural health. Dr. Sidney was one a big professor in providing like natural herbs that heal the body that you wouldn't need drugs for. So the community in and of itself, a part of it, yes, love helping people, sincerely with the belief in, in helping other people with doc, you know, medicine and things of that nature. But then there's that other segment I think that's taking advantage and manipulating and just trying to, you know, have their way. Sorry, y'all. I know that was a little not professional, that's right. but that's my passion in this. No, 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 I understand. No, there's half I, I, professional. There's both. It can, it's never, it's, one's not, you know, right. overbearing on the other. Yeah, yeah. But no, and, and to add on to what he's saying, Brooke, uh, cause him and I had these talks and had these talks with my community as a whole. You know, again, it goes back to that mistrust thing, but also goes back to what I'm what I'm starting to find out is that we would assume that a lot of doctors would have a lot of um, or have a sufficient amount of education and information on certain uh, homeopathic methods or certain uh, natural quote, quote unquote we call natural remedies outside of prescription drugs or uh, a prescribed medicine that has been cultivated over the past you know 50, 60, 70 years. And then I'm, what I'm starting to find out is a lot of them do not have that education. Um, they don't have the other side of the um, 
perspective, other, other perspective of healing modalities, medicines and things like that. But could you talk about that? Because again, you're in the medical field. So yeah. um, could you elaborate? So, okay. So again, mm -hmm. twofold, right? Mm -hmm. Because one, there has to be a want and a will to know that, right? To right. understand holistic healthcare, to to understand um, what you can do, homeopathic uh, treatments that you can do to actually address just day to day illnesses. I mean, I'll tell you, I'm the last one to take something for a cold. I'm going to the plants first. I mean, so a part of what I didn't mention in my bio or when I'm in my introduction is that during COVID, I or during the pandemic, I actually started a um, a tea business, an herbal tea business. So it's called the Green Tea Collective. And okay. um, I, I call myself an herbal expressionist um, because I look to research herbs and find their innate health benefits and provide them to my community in ways that um, they're already consuming things. So for example, I mentioned uh, herbal teas. So all of my teas are non, well, most of them are non-caffeine based. Um, and they have specific uh, herbs in them that help with things that we would be ex uh, experiencing um, side effects of COVID. So for example, mullein is one of my ingredients, breaks mm -hmm. down tar within the lungs. Yeah, um, is good. Uh, Damiana is a, uh, if you look it up, if you're, first thing you're gonna see an aphrodisiac, that is not the main. And they call everything is an aphrodisiac if it affects your, your nerves or your, mm -hmm. Or provide you any calmness. It's not a bad thing, by the way, y'all. No, it's just, it's just it's, <laughs> but I, I know that people when they hear aphrodisiac, it's like ooh taboo. Um, but just, you know, thumbs up for that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so um, Damiana has similar benefits to like marijuana. It it actually mm -hmm. provides a calming sedative effect without giving you the psychotropic properties that we would give you. Um, and so I provide these things both in er, like in tea form and smoke blend form because it's good for smoking cessation. And then I also provide it in um, uh, bath teas, which are for, mm. you know, you to for external versus also like internal mm. um, spiritual uh, mm. health. So all of that to say, I'm very much about herbal remedies. Um, for example, this morning I woke up, I have like a tincture that I make um, specifically for cold and flu. And I had a little cough this morning, so I took my little drops. <laughs> um, uh, but I encourage people to explore and better understand the innate properties that are offered um, in plants and what, what the earth provides us. But we also need to consider that, uh, you know, that the ability to treat things holistically is preventative health. In order for that to work, it has to be preventative. It cannot be reactive. Mm. You know, it, the virus can't already be, whatever you're trying to treat can't already be rampant within your system mm. and herbal remedies to actually address those things. So I'm all for preventative health and herbal remedies. Mm -hmm. um, I'm all for eating healthy. I'm all for um, the movement around uh, juicing and, you know, um, you know, all the raw diets and the veganism that's happening and, you know, all of that. Um, I think it's most important that you know your body and you feed your body appropriately, um, spiritually, physically, mentally, all of that. Um, so because that all plays into the spiritual wellness, too, plays into your holistic health. Um, so mm. get your mind right. <laughs> <laughs> I've said that many a time on here. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to veer off the initial topic. So I I agree. I can I concur. Um, where you said that uh, fifty, I think you said that fifty percent uh, uh, before. I think the history, right? yeah. So continue with so that. I'm going to so, connect into. Yeah. So this is important, though, right? Because holistic health, preventative health. All of those things are available to us, but it calls on us as a, the individual to make that decision to to want to be aware, to want to expose ourselves to that information, to not approach everything that everyone presents as taboo or, you know, well, you know, I've never heard that before, so I can't be open to it. Mm -hmm. um, it really requires us to not be traumatized and not continue to. 
uh, perpetuate our traumas of the past. So, you know, why, you know, we sometimes stop ourselves from a- gaining access simply because we're so pissed off about the access we didn't have in the past. So, you know, a lot of people don't interact with the health system simply because of, of what they know to be other people's past experiences, but every, every hospital isn't the same. And, uh, you know, I think it's important that, you know, something that Colin and I talked about offline is the push for black people to be in these spaces. So you have, you know, a number of black doctors, um, you know, the, the percentage of black doctors, percentage of black scientists, percentage of black professionals in healthcare has increased tremendously mm-hmm. over the last decade. Um, the, and when we're in those spaces, we're not just sitting there learning, we're disrupting them. We're asking the questions that are being asked right now, um, of how, how do we, how can we change the approach? How can we make sure that our people, you know, when we're talking about them in the classroom, making sure that they're spoken, you know, that we're being real about it and that we're not Mm -hmm. talking about it in these, you know, book terms, but at an actual, what we're seeing on the street terms. So I think that you know, one, we, we have we have more people like myself in these spaces, occupying these spaces. So we are, um, like I said, first black epidemiologist was the one to stop the Tuskegee experiment. So it's important to know that even though these things exist and persist, that, you know, we continue to keep and encourage young people to occupy those spaces so that, you know, when, the, when someone does end up at the clinic, they see a familiar face. Um, and so, you know, I, that really plays into the part of access, access and equity as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's very intersectional. It's all about our perceptions as well as what's being perpetuated in clinics. Um, so double-ended there. We're, mm-hmm. we're, there's responsibility on both sides. Thank mm-hmm. you so much. Um, Janaya Bruce, I'm sorry if I mispronounced yeah, your name. Your name. She says, natural health isn't beneficial to the pharmaceutical industry. Do you agree with that? So natural health, I will say, I think that it, or I guess natural remedies, you know, you could say yes and you could say no. Mm -hmm. I say no simply because, uh, I don't agree with that, simply because um, most medicines are based on natural products from the atmosphere, so, or from earths or plant components. Mm -hmm. So if you actually look up the components of the COVID-19 vaccines, you would be quite surprised as to how often you consume those things on a day-to-day basis. Mm -hmm. So you're not, it's really the scientists are using nature to break down components and present them to you in ways that can be digestible and t- specifically target based on their understanding and research different diseases so i mean nature is a part of pharmaceuticals so gotcha. there's that she specified the question she said cost wise all right so so definitely i mean you're <laughs> you're gonna be better off with your i guess uh Pharmaceutical companies, I mean, that's that's the well, another industry issue and in that um, the, the price of drugs made available. Um, I mean, specifically, I mean, we're going to talk about <laughs> exorbitant costs. Mm-hmm. The one thing that I think actually worked against us in this whole vaccine situation was the fact that it, there wasn't a cost associated with it and people were looking to be like, oh, well, they just giving it away for free. So I ain't taking that. They must want (laughs) to knock us out. But then, okay, you got that, right? But then on the other side, hepatitis C. One bottle of medication at one point was $60,000 in value. I had to deliver a bottle of medication to a patient in Brooklyn. That was the scariest little subway trip of my life. Wow, 60,000 for what? How big was the bottle? It was a 30 day supply. It was wow. that's, see, that's, see, that's 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 crazy. That's so that's, you know, yeah. and the reason and insurance companies specifically were putting taxes on patient what was required, patient data that was required for you to start the medication <laughs> simply because they wanted to make sure you were going to complete it, they didn't want to waste their money, right? Now, yeah. granted, treating one patient, you know, greatly the cost effectiveness of that, it has been seen, but it doesn't take away from the fact that at one point, 
I was having to like lobby for patients to um, lobby or uh, appeal to insurance companies um, to actually get them to approve the medications for patients and not having them do drug testing every month in order to get their medication. Um, so there's, there's, you know, again, every, everything can be approached from, from both sides. So I, I can't ignore, you know, both of them. Yeah. I, and, and, and she, you know, she made, made a, uh, Ms. Bruce made another comment says most black folks won't be introduced to natural approaches versus given a prescription for a drug. You know, yeah, and I think that's what you guys were saying. And I feel like a lot of it has to do with us as black people taking responsibility for the information that we make available to our communities. Mm -hmm. You know, like we very much understand that, you know, I mean, health literacy is is low across the board. Right. Mm -hmm. In our low income population. So making sure that we are providing digestible information on a local level, not just system. We can't wait for the system to do everything for us. And we like in talking about it, us three, we could go out and put a post tomorrow that says, hey, here are some homeopathic remedies that I, you know, have researched and found to be helpful. You know, the first thing I did during the pandemic was share my understanding of, you know, my what I do, my uh, everyday regimen. And so that involves e taking echinacea. So I take two echinaceas a day. I also take one zinc a day. I take, I told you about my um, herbal uh, tinctures that I do for cold and flu. I have teas. Um, so, you know, it, and I now am trying to share more information about that. That's the whole point of why I started the Green Tea Collective. But yes, you're right. We don't know, but we could. You're on mute, Kyle. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that, the mute noise, New York, you know, kinds of noise. So yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying in reference of um, the preventative part. I think the key point is, like I said, the health, the health literacy in our communities are low and it's low in general across America as we see what's going on. Uh, but I also think that, uh, and also want to add on, uh, you mentioned, you kind of touched on the briefly, the chronic illnesses. How, right. how, how do we begin to change that narrative of the chronic illnesses? Because like you said, this is not something that just started happening now. This is this is intergenerational. This is stemming from what they call, what, um, since you're an epidemiologist, they talk about uh, uh, epigenetics. Could you mm -hmm. talk to us about like epigenetics as far as how that has affected whole families and generations? They say, oh, that runs in my family. Could you break that down? The same way we talk about generational wealth, we need to be talking about generational health, okay? Like it's, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. And specifically here in the South, it's something that is plaguing us and it's wiping out our communities. The reason our, we as people of color are terrible in maintaining our day-to-day -day health. We wait until we find every reason in the book not to go to the doctor. We will wait. We will. And so just mm -hmm. to be a hundred percent like you know yeah, i'm married real. to an emergency right. medicine physician so i got i got stories for days okay, about yeah. people waiting waiting until their birthday after their birthday party to go to the doctor or they go once a year on their birthday to get that health <laughs> checkup but it's after they had all that cake or they decided you know it's their birthday i don't want to take my blood pressure medication today i don't want to be running to the bathroom i don't want to mm -hmm. You know, we come up with all types of excuses of why we can't do things for ourselves that would better ourselves. So it's it's very, you know, a lot of our chronic diseases are actually a manifestation of our own inability to care for ourselves, mm. as well as mm. uh, our, again, mistrust of the system, because, you know, it's you know, you'll sit in pain. How many of us know, you know, <laughs> It rains and we're talking about our bones hurt, but you know, what if that hurt is something that actually needs to be checked out? But we, we're like, oh, but it, you know, it's raining, it's fine. Oh, uh, well, go do, ahead. <laughs> Dr. Brooke, we gotta do a part two for real. Cause it's, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure, cause everybody's telling our, uh, all right, so real quick, real quick. I know we gotta, Kyle, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to throw. No, no, no. Um, all right, so. Do you think, Doctor Doctor Book? Do you? I know far more info. I got it. Don't worry, I'll figure it out. But do you think that a part of that apathy on our part as a culture is because, specifically in this country, the United States, health is so expensive? 
Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that, you know, it's what we tell ourselves, right? Because we tell ourselves health is so expensive. Oh, when I get to the doctor, we create in our heads before we even get to the doctor's office. And I'm guilty of this, of, you know, what I'm going to experience, um, whether or not I'm going to experience a discriminative, uh, you know, if I'm going to experience that today, or is it going to be an easy peasy? Or am I going to feel like I'm talking to my provider and I'm not heard? Um, mm -hmm. But we also have to be cognizant of how we interact with the system. We're the first people to go to the emergency room for basic care. Do you know the most costly thing you could ever do? Go to the emergency room. <laughs> yeah. So we're treating the emergency room like it's a primary care office. And then concerned when we see that bill. Well, the copay for the primary care doctor might be $40. I mean, that's the most I've seen and dealing with uh, my population, but that, that, that ED bill is going to be a lot more. And then you're going to be saying, you know, see, this is why I don't go to the doctor. Well, you didn't go to the doctor. You went to the emergency room. So, yeah. All right. So, all right. I, oh, I right, Cal. I'm not and hold on one more thing about yeah. that. So that, yeah. that, and, and going to the emergency room, that's also how we blow the system because and going to the emergency room, we're not taking, we're not taking, we're not, we're not thinking about anyone else but ourselves when we get there. We're not thinking about the how, if we're there for something minor and we were just impatient and didn't want to make the appointment with our primary care doc, the bed, the seat, mm -hmm. the time that that takes away from a patient that needed that care. Yeah. And now you have uh, you know, a minor patient sitting here who feels like they need, you know, service immediately. And you're in a system where that's just not the case. That's not how things work. You can't, you can't rush, rush the system once you get there. Um, and so that brings us to the issue of like not listening and not maintaining and, pre and doing the preventative needs, the preventative things that are needed to prevent us from getting to that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll keep asking questions. No, we got, we got quite. We got questions. People coming. Got in. Questions. Which is questions. beautiful. Um, I'm well. Well, one of uh, a previous guest we had on, Mr. Lennon Shatinge, uh, he said, uh, "Very informative, Doc." He said, "I'm going to go for my checkup in a couple of weeks." <laughs> good. Good. How do we navigate the trust issues with the system, and how do we incorporate African diaspora health models that benefit us? In so. Our um, I encourage everyone to get familiar with their local legislation. I can't emphasize more how policy plays a part into all of these things. We have an excellent uh, local government in New York City that pushes for the elimination of hepatitis C specifically within New York State. Um, here in Louisiana, there's also a local government push for um, treating patients um, with hepatitis C, but outside of that, right? There, there's the, that, the, I'm speaking to hepatitis C because that's my disease area. Mm -hmm. Liver disease is my concentration. So I know of everything that's happening in liver disease that specifically pushes for um, the debunking of, or, the, or investigating how these disparities are affecting us. So there's information out there for you to read about, you know, what actually, what's the landscape right now? And then after you've informed yourself on what the landscape is, you can then decide about how you want to move within that landscape. A lot of patients, I, rem I remember my first patient at Mount Sinai came there. He had all types of issues. He was very irate, yelled at me for like 30 minutes straight, mm -hmm. um, told me I wasn't going to be able to do anything for him. The system was a sham. Mm -hmm. And so I was just like, well, what's, what's your biggest concern? What's the first thing you need from me? What do you need from me? And he was just like, well, I, I don't understand why my insurance company hasn't approved X, Y, Z. OK, well, by Monday, I will have investigated this. If I can't come to you with a better answer for what it is you're asking me, then fine. I'll, don't move forward with care with us. But it would, didn't even take me until Monday. By the end of that day, I had already gotten approved the thing that it was a small hiccup that wasn't communicated to the patient. It was just a small thing that needed to be done. And he got that ended up getting the um, approved for his medications. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's really patience, exercising patience and not getting frustrated when you run into a provider that 
isn't necessarily um, appropriate. I mean, you know, the uh, what we noted about when medical providers were exposed to public health and uh, social health, it was in recent generations. So you have decades of doctors out there who have not been trained on how to handle these situations mm. and how to meet the patient, meet the patient's mental needs and social needs in a medical setting. Mm -hmm. They also may not work in health systems that um, have social workers there to to meet with patients outside of the clinic setting. Or for example, care coordination is a big model right now that needs to be implemented, implemented in every medical setting. There are extensive studies that show that care coordination models um, across all disease entities improve cost effectiveness, not only cost effectiveness of care delivery because it's assessing the individual patient and assigning specific resources that would help that patient versus just blanketly saying, hey, here's everything. I don't know what you might need. Figure it out. Uh, so there's there's more tailored, multidisciplinary approaches happening in clinic environments that would be more supportive of the patient. And if you don't like your experience, I encourage you to speak up because it just if you walk out of there frustrated, you can only imagine the person who's coming behind you and, gonna, and is going to have that same experience. It's not until we speak up and hold people accountable for how we're treated in these settings that we'll actually see the change that we need. Fantastic point. Mm -hmm. I want to bring up something real quick. I have two questions, Calvin. I'm just going to get into it. We got, we got yeah. some time. So I'll make sure we get into um, I hope Suzanne Holman, she says, we have to be, like, to your point, Dr. Brooke, we have to be more proactive and address trauma associated with our past, such as the Tuskegee, uh, you know, as you mentioned before. I don't want to uh, mess that up. And she also says, healthcare can be purchased today on the marketplace through the Affordable Care Act for a low monthly premium, in some cases it's free. Do you agree? Exactly, yeah. And I, and I encourage, and that's another reason that you should get it, you should become familiar, not even with local policy, but your local health department. Mm -hmm. Because there are resources out there, there are people whose whole jobs are to go through the process for you. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, you know, in New York City, at Mount Sinai, I'll, I'll speak to them, uh, there's a, a an office called REACH. And it's, it's literally, there to for patients to show up that have issues in applying for insurance or don't know how to don't know where to begin and they'll do it for you they walk you through the process and they make sure that it's handled there's no reason that people should be uninsured these days it's just it's it's unbelievable to me that there's still a good portion of our population that are and again as she spoke to you know for those who are um who, do, who don't feel that they have the income to pay for healthcare, there are a number of um, resources out there now that are available. I, I mean, I had a friend who was traveling and got sick um, specifically, and this is interesting because uh, one of what, what she became sick with was actually uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a side effect of um, the vaccine one side effect mm. um it's a very rare side effect but i'm gonna yeah, I've uh, it's never heard interesting of it. i've never heard it's of interesting it. because it is something that you can your own body can induce um you could be sh stress could induce it uh not drinking water and dehydrating your body and being mm. stressed can induce it and it's essentially where your immune system attacks your nervous cells, your nerve cells, and could eventually, I mean, in some extreme cases, result in paralysis of like the, a, a, a side of your body. I don't know mm -hmm. if you guys remember one of the first black people that actually got the vaccine um, during the Trump uh, days, um, they put, they were like flashing her all across the news, black woman who had, she, had paralysis on the left side of her face. I, I somewhere remember and that. Yeah. They were pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. Mm -hmm. And it was pissing me off because then nowhere in there did they, dis they, did they discuss that your own body could make this happen. It had, without any vaccine. Mm. So it, it, she could have been stressed thinking about getting the vaccine. And because her immune system was already on high like that, you know, being that, you know, the vaccine could have actually just further uh, exasperated those issues. But 
Um, all of that to say, the young lady, uh, she thought she was uninsured. And so she thought that she would not be able to get insurance to, uh, she's like, what am I gonna do? Like, now they're telling me I have all these different things mm -hmm. and uh, you know, there I have no insurance. Well, me understanding that there are these caveats within the healthcare system to make these things work, um, you know, I took her on as my own case. And essentially she got full treatment. We got her back to the US, she got full treatment. She recovered fully. And that treatment was well over in the 100 Ks and she didn't pay a cent for it. Right. Um, and so, and it was because we advocated, you know, the first time that social worker appeared, I was like, we are not letting her go. She's gonna know you like the back of, your, like the back of her hand. And sure enough, there was, they were able to, because there's, there's always, you should always talk to doctors, you should always ask questions because you never know if a caveat may appear. And it just so happened that this was a teaching hospital and it was of benefit for them to treat her to teach the other doctors about this disease um, because it's so rare and when it pops up. So free care, free treatment. I'm gonna have to look at this video again because we're gonna do a part two. <laughs> I'm reviewing this. One. So two things, uh, Dr. Brooke. Uh, um, well, there's one, there's one comment that sister made about the mortality rate of mothers and children. Um, uh, oh my goodness. Yeah. Let me tell you, I, so if you would like to, black now, mother. listen, we can't, I can't cover every, every area of, course, of, of black course. Health, yeah, right. but <laughs> I can point you in the direction of another um, woman of color, another black woman that is very well versed in this area. Um, Nicole uh, Chadwick, she's out of LA um, and she is a black OBGYN out there. Mm -hmm. um, I'll definitely add, I can like, give you all her information, tag yeah. her. Yeah. Um, but she does a number of different talks um, that are on black maternal health. And I'm sure she would enjoy all of your questions. Perfect. And yeah, we definitely gonna need that contact information. Real quick, Kyle, yes. I have two questions. One sure. is gonna be addressing Ms. View, Ms. Bruce, because what you just shared is very informative, uh, Brooke, which is great, but here there's still people who their experience with the Fe Affordable Health Care Act is negative. She says, there is an issue when we look at affordable health care insurance, even in analyzing the Affordable Care Act, it's so expensive. So, how does that Yeah, happen? I mean, listen, like I said, it, it, it can, there's, there's, it can be expensive. It can be, but what, what, what we have to, and I was actually just talking to a friend about this. We were talking about something very small and that she was like, yeah, but they, you know, we were talking about progress being made on something. She was like, yeah, but they haven't done this, this, and this, and this. And I was like, well, I mean, can all of that be done overnight? Or can we at least be grateful for some of the forward movement in our system that le leaves us with hope that we understand even with more work to be done, that there's a space and opportunity to do it. I mean, insurance has been on the forefront. We lost four years on that. And I mean, Barack was making great progress, but we lost four years, point blank. We were sitting still for four years and none of that was being addressed. And half of America said they were okay with that. So the sister of Hope, Suzanne Holman mentioned about black men being distrustful. This goes right into our question with dealing with the vaccine. Black men, black women, people of color in general, being mistrustful of vaccine, putting stuff in my arm. What's this RNA stuff that they talking about? I, I, you know, let's, let's go into it. Let's go into it. Let's talk about it. All right. So <laughs> where do we begin? Right. <laughs> Oh my, okay. So as we have laid the foundation of, we very much understand why there is mistrust. We very much understand the foundation is laid. We don't need to deny that. That's, that's, a, that's an understanding, okay? No debate there. One, there's addressing how we interact with that trauma. So shaping your own opinions and informing yourself about what your personal relationship is with that. So. I mean, you you weren't a part of the syphilis experiment, so like, let's really dig into what what is your trepidation there? Is it mm -hmm. that you know you feel like there hasn't been enough forward thought around um, including black people in studies outside of uh, when they don't you know don't offer consent? 
Is it that, you know, your issue is that you think that any and all things injected or injectable medications are there to alter your DNA? We need to we need to be more. We can't just give blanket statements anymore. We can't say, oh, it's Tuskegee. Oh, it's be more specific about what your actual feelings are, because then once you present yeah. present those feelings, I can actually address those things. So that's what it, it that's what I think uh when we're when we're being more honest about what our fears are, um, we can actually address those things more direct. So that's one aspect of it, right? Um, yes. The other aspect is, uh, so take your time. Take your time. Yeah. Take your time. <laughs> Take your time, child. Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because there, there's this idea, right? That the main thought, the main in, in the black men that I've talked to, mm-hmm. the explanation that has been given to me as to why they have not or are, or are not going to be vaccinated is because one, they take care of themselves and they have altered their lifestyle to accommodate not, or they don't feel like they would, uh, I guess, be severely infected by COVID Mm -hmm. if they did, if they did get it, or they don't, they actually don't think they could get it simply because their immune system is so well fortified. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I've also heard, well, everybody else is getting it, so I don't need to get it. Mm. Um, And I've also heard, Um, And the main one across all individuals has been, um, well, the vaccine is experimental. Mm. Now, y'all wait for it because it's coming. So, (laughs) (laughs) Long before the storm, (laughs) y'all. Now, when we talk about, okay, so (laughs) there's so many things, so many things. So when we talk about um, fortifying immune systems, yes. We know that the whole uh, issue with COVID is that it attacks your immune system and it it causes you, your immune system to essentially attack any area of your body that showed weakness, right? Right. That's what I heard. All right. If you aren't going to the doctor yearly Mm. and getting not just your basic exam, but actually doing the investigate, getting your labs run and everything. You don't know what underlying conditions you do and don't have. You don't know what your protein, you don't know anything about your labs, essentially. Let's just say that. We're talking inflammation could be an underlying illness that could be, uh, you know, exasperated by COVID infection. So inflammation can occur anywhere. Mm -hmm. Inflammation can occur, you you can get an ear infection, Mm -hmm. not even know it. COVID, I mean, so a lot of patients, what they were experiencing when they got COVID was this, you know, exasperated addition, whatever was underlying before has been exasperated to, you know, and and the other thing is that your body has its own chemical makeup. No, and it's, it's, it's different for everybody. So you have no understanding of how all those pieces working together. It could be in great, uh, it could be in sync right now, but you throw one thing in there and it could just totally, you don't know how that one, it's the same thing as like a computer virus. You don't know how that one thing is about to blow your whole laptop, like that one link that you click. So I say that to say that fortified or not, we are all at risk. We've seen healthy, young, healthy people go into the hospital and have the worst cases sometimes. And no one have any understanding of why that, what, where, who, what, when, where, how we got there. The second is um, what I said about uh, everyone, everyone else is getting it, so why do I have to do it? Mm -hmm. It's a very selfish mentality to take on. Mm -hmm. And it's selfish because it's relying on everyone else. It really pissed me off when black men made these statements because the uh, most of those black men live in households where a black woman is vaccinated. Mm. And it brought me back to this thought of constantly, mm. we are relying on other people 
And in our black households, most often the black woman to carry and lead us forward in that way of making those healthy decisions for us mm -hmm. or leaning into those more or risking themselves and offering themselves and sacrificing themselves first. Mm -hmm. So that mentality of you versus me doesn't work. It mm -hmm. also doesn't work because if I'm being vaccinated and the whole point of the vaccinations was to establish herd immunity, it doesn't work because then you got Delta. Because had we all listened up front and had we all gotten vaccinated and not thought about this and waited so long, great, vaccination rates are going up now. Now that you're aware that there's a Delta virus, Delta variant that's more viral than the Alpha variant, now that you're aware of you know, what it could mean to be out here vaccinated and allowed into spaces, but where was that energy three months ago when we actually had an opportunity to establish herd immunity and actually stop the, the, the mutation of this variant at the rapid rate of which it happened? So there's a science behind it. You know, we weren't asking for everyone to get vaccinated just because just because we didn't want you to get COVID. That wasn't it. When they told when they put out vaccination information to start. It specifically said to decrease disease severity, meaning to stop hospitalizations and death and mortality. That was the, the overall push of the vaccinations. There was a, there was some, and then with the caveat that it would decrease infections relative to COVID-19. There's a star there. It didn't say every variant of COVID-19. It okay. said COVID-19 variant A, okay, that's like good. the first, the alpha. Okay, that was so, a quick one to ask in reference to that. Yeah, so the vaccines were developed based on the study of the science of COVID-19 alpha. The science, we, the research has continued to delve into the efficacy of those vaccines with Delta. And I don't know if you guys are also aware of, there's another variant called Lambda that's coming down the pipe. We just gonna keep going down this road until we get there. I mentioned, but that's what viruses do, right? Viruses- Exactly. They, they mutate they the mutate same right. way. Think they about it like this. <laughs> it's, it's a weed, it's a weed. Yeah, it they literally is a weed. If you water, if, if it rains heavy, your weeds quickly spread, they grow. Yep. And it's in how quickly do you look at your flower bed and everything looks fine and then you go back, look a week later, and you're like, huh? why do I look like that? Right. Um, so we have to think of things in those sim more simple terms of, you know, yes, uh, you could make the individual decision that you're going to protect yourself and you're not going to expose yourself and you're not going to do this, any other. But even in making those decisions, you're still reliant on everyone else doing the same thing. You're still reliant on trusting other people's health behaviors and you can't control those behaviors. And you also can't control that these people are going to tell you the truth. So there's just, there's some, there's so many aspects um, that go into it. Um, but I wanted to lay out a few, um, a few uh, facts around exactly what we do know versus what we're still learning when it comes to the vaccines. Um, well, actually, before I do that, I want to hit point number three, which was uh, experimental. The idea that vaccines are experimental. Mm -hmm. Right. Because because there's an idea, uh, uh, Brooke, that, you know, it's <laughs> experimental. So people are not taking it because if something happens, they can't sue the people. They can't bring them up on charges of uh, malpractice. These are the ideas that are floating around. Right. OK, so. Go ahead. No, go ahead. The also concern for women and men is that it, it could possibly make them sterile based on historic, uh, you know, history and stuff. Yeah. All right. So one first first before I jump into the experimental side of it, we're going to I'm just going to run down a couple myths that have been out there and I'm going to answer those myths. And then I'm going to talk about um, this whole experimental side of things. 
So the first is, um, do any of the COVID-19 vaccines authorized for use in the U.S. shed their components? Because we've talked about mRNA versus viral, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, viral vector. Okay. Um, so no vaccine shedding is not, does not occur with COVID-19 vaccines. So the release and the discharge of the components of the vaccine in inside of our bodies, um, it does not, excuse me, it, the only time that that would occur was if we were being given a weakened version of the virus, which is not the case. Um, none of the vaccines that are administered within the US actually contain a live virus. And the only two types of ways to receive the, the actual vaccine components are through what I just stated, which are the mRNA, the messenger RNA vaccines, and then the viral vector vaccines. So for example, J&J uh, &J was a viral vector mm -hmm. and Moderna and Pfizer are mRNA. Okay. Um, so on. this actually- Before you go, uh, Tonette Delk mentioned that, as a matter of fact, she said the messenger R RNA is a huge concern. Okay, so let's let's just let let me let me give you a little bit of information about the mRNA versus the viral vector. I'm going to try and run through this really quickly. So I apologize if I'm speaking fast, but yeah. you know, I clearly we're going to be on here for two hours. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, so, two hours. So they they've said that mRNA. You know, the biggest thing is that they're hearing new. Right. And new is what we're holding on to. New means it hasn't been investigated. We don't know what it's doing. It could like invade our bodies. New and science just means new to you, not new to us. So it's something that's new to the public, but it's not something that's new to in the study of diseases. It's not it's it's often the what we do on the back end. It's the quick version. It's the quick way to get things, messenger RNA is the quick way to um, send send the vaccine or to send whatever medical components you're trying to in a, in a, in a, in a research perspective. So yes, they are new to you all. The, the mRNA triggers an immune response um, that occurs in our body um, and it, it teaches our cells how to make the proteins or even just a piece of a protein that triggers that response to for our immune system to recognize it and to then uh, be able to address it appropriately without attacking our, our own body. So that immune response, it produces antibodies that works to protect us against getting infected. So essentially, if the real virus were to invade our bodies, the mRNA antibodies that are already there spike and stop full infection or mitigate full infection. I shouldn't say stop, mitigate. Um, so it really is just a harmless piece of a spike protein that travels through our body and delivers the COVID-19 vaccine to us. Um, it's specifically done within muscle cells. So it's not altering any of your DNA components within your bloodstream. Um, and essentially it's just, it's, it's, an, it's an indicator for our body to say, hey, when you see this, you know what to do now. Here's, here's the code of what to do. A viral vector vaccine um, is just a modified version of a different virus. So specifically, I can't remember the name right now. It's, I think it's a Dino something, um, but that's the one that they use as the viral vector um, for the COVID-19 vaccine. So the viral vector vaccines are used to send a modified version of the virus to deliver that same information that the mRNA is delivering to our cells. So really, it's the same information being delivered. It's just about the efficacy of that vaccine versus the other. 
So no one is ne necessarily worse than the other. What we're then, once we get past the mRNA versus viral vector, it's really about the components of the vaccines themselves and understanding the science behind, you know, J and J. So they had a lower efficacy rate when it came to COVID infection. But when you looked at preventing hospitalizations or death, it was pretty much comparable to Moderna as well as Pfizer. So there was re there's really no difference in any, any of the vaccines in preventing hospitalization and death. But there does come into this extra protective layer when you get the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines of having greater efficacy and actually the experience if you were to get COVID. Um, so that's uh, we, we, I look, we, we, you got a question? Why was J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, taken off the shelves? So, okay. So um, with any adverse effects, so there's the, there's a surveillance system that monitors adverse effects with any um, vaccine or drug that's put out there. Um, specifically, I will applaud the U.S. in making sure that we got our advert, our reporting system up and running very early. So there's a there's been a lot of data out there about the adverse effects. Um, J and J specifically was pulled because of the side effect um, related to thrombosis with, and I'm going to probably butcher this but thrombocytopenia syndrome, which we'll just call TTS from now on. Um, but TTS, there were 39 cases and 13 million vaccines administered. So 39 cases out of 13 million. Um, the reason that it got pulled is because of how quickly those cases appeared specifically within a very small cohort um, which was concerning. So they immediately needed to better understand how, whether or not this was going to be pervasive or not. Now, again, when vaccine studies are underway, right, this goes into the trauma of the healthcare system. What don't we sign up for? Experimental studies. How are we supposed to know how these vaccines affect our population before they actually get out there? Experimental studies. Mm -hmm. If we are so untrusting of the system, we're never going to appear in those experimental studies. There will never be data to speak to our specific experience. So that's why sometimes it is important for us to address those traumas up front and understand that the system that we exist in now, although those disparities may still exist, it's still built to push science forward. And so every experiment can't be a bad experiment because I promise you it's going to save your life one day. So Somebody had to make the decision, right? So we're learning right now in live time how this is affecting our communities. And that's what we're holding on to, right? Like 39 cases is not a lot. However, when we hear that it affects women under the age of 50 more, that became a little more concerning. So the FDA really just needed to quickly say, all right, let me make sure that this isn't a pervasive case. And they did. They assured us that it was not. There have not. There's only been two additional cases since. And those two actually appeared under Moderna and not J&J. &J. So it really is, again, we, we have no understanding of the human, like, everything we do on a day-to-day -day basis is guesswork about our bodies. When we feel something, like, there's something that signals us to say that we're thirsty and we drink water. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that doesn't quench the thirst and you're like, all right, well, what was that? Well, maybe if I go lay down for a few minutes, I'll feel better. These are the decisions that we're making about, you know, this is the same thing. You're the same way that you on a day to day basis work through how you treat your body is the same way that we're approaching it in science. And the other thing is that we've been left out of science for so long that we're now playing catch up. So, of course, it feels more taxing on us. Of course, we feel like we're being experimented on more because there's we need to know more. Um, and we also, there's like a fine line there of not overtaxing our communities and putting it, them in these studies and making sure that, you know, we're not, uh, that there isn't like, there's a specific term that goes with that. Um, but essentially like you can't sign the same black person up for every, every study. Like that's, that's not, that's not feasible. That's not actually a real world experience either. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there's just so many factors that go into all of this. Now, yep. I do want, since we're talking about ad- adverse effects, I will quickly run through all of the other adverse effects that have appeared. So anaphylaxis, which is, um, you know, an a, a allergy reaction, allergic reaction, that's very rare. Um, that appears in two to five cases per million vaccinated. So, but this is a common, if, if you go back and look at any of the vaccines that we've previously received, that's, I mean, that's, it's pretty standard. That's going to be on there. Um, we, and then I talked about the Gan beret um, syndrome, which is a rare disorder that where the body's immune system damages nerve cells and can result in paralysis. Um, and that's being monitored. Now it's being, mo- it hasn't happened. It's very rare in the, in response to the vaccine, but it's being monitored because we know that COVID-19, any, any variant attacks the immune system. Mm-hmm. And that's the main stressor in uh, Gambare. So, and then the last, the, the other one that we have is the big one that all of the black men sent me articles on, which was the um, myocarditis, um, essentially slowing of the heart rate heart palpitations, feels like you're having a heart attack. Um, And so that was seen in about 1,200 patients um, and those under 30. And it was particularly in males that had taken the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Now, the one study that I read on this, that and because I only really read peer-reviewed articles, um, not just any study that's put out there, the one peer reviewed study that came out on that showed that the study was based in a popul in a heavy in a population that has um, early exposure to hookah smoking. Hmm. Um, and hookah in that specific demographic um, it happens as early as twelve years of age. So when and it's in a population where um, the male gender is uh, most dominant. So we have to take context with these things because if mm-hmm. you tell me it's in a puka heavy population, it's male dominated and they're having heart problems, do we not know what smoking hookah does? Is that not an underlying condition? Right. So. We just have to. So I look at I look at I look at it all um, when I'm when I'm when I'm thinking about that. So now, okay. So we've talked about screening. We've talked about no, yes. Uh, excuse me. We've talked about uh, how the vaccine is delivered. Mm-hmm. We've talked about adverse side effects. Mm-hmm. I'd like to talk about what we do know about the vaccine, specific to Blacks and Hispanics. Um, so currently, right now, 68.3 percent of the population has received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Among this, um, it's nearly two thirds are white, 9% black, uh, 16% were Hispanic, 6% Asian, um, 1% American Indian or Alaska Native, um, and then 8% reported multiple or other race. Um, The overarching thought is that black and Hispanic people have received smaller shares of vaccinations compared to the shares of cases and compared to their shares of the total population in most states. Mm -hmm. That is not saying that they have not been made available. That is saying that our uptake has been low relative to the disease burden on our, on our community. Mm -hmm. So although we have been seeing an uptick in recent patterns of, um, vaccination that show the narrowing of those racial gaps, it's still important to note that um, we, we experienced the, the more severe, um, severe uh, outcomes of this disease. So for example, uh, what is it? In California, 30% of the vaccinations have gone to Hispanic people while they account for 63% of cases and 48% of deaths. Mm. Um, Similarly, in DC, we have black people who have received 43% of vaccinations while they make up 56% of cases 
and 71% of deaths. Mm. Um, so when you think about the fact that access is there, the fact that you can get a vaccine just about anywhere right now and for free, and to know that the disease severity is greatest in our populations, this comes into question of, of, of ex what is experimental? Is it more experimental for me to think that I can get COVID and recover and be treated and have treatment in a hospital and recover? Or is it more experimental for me to get, a, get the vaccination? And this is where I encourage people to don't just listen to me, go look it up because right. you can Google right now, COVID-19 vaccine ingredients. And there are the first four things that pop up all reputable, click on any one of them. What they will tell you are that the, the components of these vaccines are very simple. It's made, it's about four or five ingredients. One of which is lipids. One of it, uh, mm. the other simple sugars. Um, you know, so become knowledgeable about just how experimental is it? Not, it's not, it's not really. Now we talk about when you do get COVID. Okay. And I'm a, I took, got some notes from the hospital on this. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you were to get COVID and you <laughs> had to appear at a hospital for treatment, not these, I'm just going to run down. I can't pronounce all these things right. So please forgive me if there, are, if there are medical doctors on here. But, well, like you said, um, research. I gotta do our research. but the first, the, this, this in order of severity could be what happens to you when you show up at the hospital with COVID. So, you know, and if you're showing up at the hospital, you don't have the basic, oh, I just feel real yucky. Um, you know, you're there because you're having something that is beyond a flu-like symptom. So most patients, you know, that actually are um, presenting, you know, the first thing you go on is oxygen. If the oxygen doesn't work, your oxygen drops, then you're on a nasal cannula, which is just a high. And then you go from just a regular nasal cannula to a high flow, which is essentially oxygen being pushed into your body. Then. If you at that point, if you're starting to what I mean, the most, I guess, relative experience I could give you is if right before you're about when you start to feel like you're about to drown and you start and, you know, you're just like that franticness. That's that's what's happening. Just laying there. You're just in that constant state of anxious struggle for air. And. I, if you could imagine seeing someone getting ready to drown and the reaction that that sends in your body to do something, imagine doctors seeing that every day. Imagine beds lined up of people gasping and fighting for air. So then, and that's, you know, I mean, that's the basic version of COVID. So then we move to, let's say they, their oxygen doesn't improve. Let's say then you're on positive pressure, pressure oxygen, which is just blowing it into your face and you have no control over your own breathing anymore. So how we're choosing to comfortably breathe right now and giving our bodies what it is we feel we need, you have no control anymore. Um, then you have permissive hypoxia, um, which is essentially basically saying, all right, well, this person is, I mean, they're struggling. They, they don't, they really look like they can't breathe, but putting them on a ventilator would be worse. So we're just going to sit here and hope for the best. And mm -hmm. we're going to monitor them. And only at the very last minute, if it's absolutely necessary, will we move to the vent? Okay. So then if you, if you do not, if you actually end up having to go on the vent, one, we already know that vents are, we, we've been through this before. We've seen where the resources go. You additionally, then you have the intubation. And then in less, again, talking about, you have the choice of breathing, right? When you go to get intubated, they basically have to paralyze you and uh, strap you down to the bed mm -hmm. and sedate you so that hopefully you don't, because your muscles, right? Are, even if you're unconscious, your muscles are still going to fight what's happening. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to stick this tube down your throat that's the size of a straw. And 
and it is, and your muscles are contracting, trying to stop it. And that tube goes, and then you have the intubation tube that goes to your stomach to pump all the contents of your stomach out in order to make sure that enough, you know, you can breathe. Um, and then you, you, it's, it's, it's everything is experimental after that point. Everything they're doing is experimental. Hmm. No one, no one, I mean, at least we had time to study these vaccines. We have no time to actually look at case studies to see, we're only looking at case studies. We're only looking at case by case hmm. presentations to, to figure out the treatments that actually happen for it in the hospital. So you essentially at that point have signed your up, signed yourself up for all types of experimental shit. Excuse me. <laughs> no, that's, so, that's fine. You have experimental ventilator settings, experimental COVID antibody infusion. Mm -hmm. So regardless of whether or not you ain't want that vaccine to begin with, you're getting the antibodies that are in the vaccine when you go in to be treated. So there's just, there's, there's all these different experimental components that as soon as you enter the hospital, you're like, yes, I, I signed myself up for all of that. But yet you won't sign yourself up for the vaccine that could potentially prevent all of this. And then you're going to be mad when you get those hospital bills for all that experimental stuff they didn't put on you. And let's not even talk about after you actually get COVID and the COVID brain that comes with it, the fatigue, fatigue the, yeah. you know, having to get back no into your, yeah. So, I mean, there's just, there's so many different aspects. So that's why when people tell me, oh, the vaccine is experimental, miss me with that. Like it's, it's, it's actually not as experimental as if you go to the hospital and get treated. So I will take that vaccine. Those are all valid points. Cal, you want to say something before I come in? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say, well, thank you for sharing that. First yes. Of all, yes. Laying that all out yes. for us. Yeah. As a people, I, we, I appreciate that. We appreciate yeah. that because again, you know, we may have our certain views on it personally, but it is about the people, the community being very informed as well as we being informed. Right. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. Um, now I will I will interject this. I've heard from and, and again it could be, I don't know it could have been a deep fake I don't know, but I heard Fauci saying something of the people who receive the vaccine are the ones that are more likely to spread the Delta variant. Could you briefly speak on that? Right. So this is actually this is a cognitive thing more than it is a science thing. It's mm -hmm. it's more about uh, or behavioral, excuse me. So because we're protected and because we're out here uh, playing with unvaccinated folks, we are we could be more viral carriers simply because we won't know that we we won't feel the severity of the infection. We might feel, we might not, we might not actually feel anything. We might be asymptomatic. So we could be a carrier and be moving through spaces. So if we're interacting with, un, and, this, and this is the, it really comes into play more so when it's unvaccinated versus vaccinated. You know, so if I'm interacting with unvaccinated folks and I'm vaccinated and I'm going to be fine, but I still have to be concerned about and take responsibility for the people that, I, that are unvaccinated. And this is where the selfishness comes comes in because by mm -hmm. being responsible for that person, it's a, a an added responsibility for me. I didn't now I can choose to take that on, or I could just be able to say, well, I protected myself. Y'all should protect yourselves. Mm -hmm. So, and I could bounce to the next location and be a carrier, or I could be responsible and say, well, I know that I was around unvaccinated folks. Let me wait three to five days, see what happens before I go into another unvaccinated environment. Right. Um, and so that's, that kind of gets also to what we were talking about, Kyle, about, um, the tests and how sometimes, you know, you could be tested for COVID and get a false positive or a false negative. Mm -hmm. The, you know, COVID testing is the least, is the least accurate within three days of exposure. So, you know, all these people running out here getting tested after they, immediately run into contact with somebody if you're doing that within 24 to 72 hours it's not you're not actually the virus hasn't had enough time to actually build within your system to be detectable mm. so it's best to be tested five to seven days post exposure but that requires self-discipline 
because right. you have to be disciplined enough to sit inside for five to seven days and not go out here trying to excuse your behaviors and being like, oh, well, I just did or, you know, making excuses. So self-discipline, that's a us thing. That's a personal thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's something to consider. And then there's two types. So you have the PCR test and the antigen test. Antigen tests are the least accurate because it's just testing for proteins. And it's basically the preliminary tests that you should receive. If you were to receive a positive on an antigen test, um, they would uh, tell you to go ahead and get a PCR test. And so the PCR test uh, is a polymerase chain reaction and it's a fluid sample that's collected. um, And it's that's the swabbing, the long swab that happens where they're going to the back of your nasal canal as well as or sometimes they'll do your throat. But even then, you know, this viral, this is a viral infection, which means it moves through your body. So the infection starts here, but by day seven, it's probably here. Mm -hmm. So when you're, when you're in the hospital, you're getting, you're not just getting the regular PCR test that's with the swab. At this point, they're doing, taking fluid samples, potentially from your lung, your chest, whatever the case may be Mm -hmm. to test that fluid to see, okay, well, is the virus here now? Um, So again, nuances to all of these things, which is why at some point it really calls on us as a community to have better preventative practices so that we don't even have to enter into the game. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have to play the game. We're choosing to play the game. And that's the difference in how we um, are interacting with our past medical traumas because our past will tell us not to. Our past will tell us to play this game. Our past tells us this is a game. Oh, I gotta do this. Oh, I gotta, nah, this information is out, you know, out is is against the black community or, you know, I'm hearing this, that, and the other, and we're playing the game. Or we could just follow directions when they're first given to us and understand that there are black people behind the scenes trying to get this information out there. They're sitting at the tables, they're having the conversations, they're putting themselves out there to say, hey, I know this may seem experimental, I know this may seem a little crazy, but this is real, this is what happens. We've never in our lifetimes experienced a pandemic. This is the reality of it all. We're trying to re, you know, recourse what's happening or, to, or control what's happening um, we really don't have a good understanding of what we're trying to control. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's all to say, um, if the disease affects us more gravely, if the mortality rates more so affect people of color, is it better for us to die from infection versus from vaccination? Mm-hmm because the mortality rate, so death by vaccination, so from December, 2020 to July 26, 2021, Mm -hmm. there were 6,340 deaths that were reported of 342 million doses administered. Now, it's always important and I encourage you when you hear those numbers, because what you heard first was a 6,000 and that probably felt like a lot. Right. But what I encourage you to do is do the math. 6,340 divided by 342 million comes out to being less than 0.02%. That's nothing. Mm -hmm. Are we making the best decision for ourselves by saying to take, let's take the risk. Do I mean, it's, it's honestly, it's, 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 survival of the fittest. It's who's going to, mm-hmm. who's going to do the, go the length of making themselves knowledgeable enough to make the decision and then feel, stand behind it and to exercise the self-discipline that comes with it. Listen, I don't care if you don't want to get vaccinated. I honestly don't, but be responsible. Do not put yourself in environments where you could be a vector for perpetuating this more for our communities. You know, a lot of us that are in social activism and community work are the people who are not getting vaccinated. And that's a problem for me because as we saw with the five-year-old in Georgia, he went to summer camp. No one in his household was infected. 
We also just saw that in DC, Children's Hospital. Kids are dying. Kids can't get vaccinated. We can. We're out here providing care for these children. We're, we're signing ourselves up for that, to be a beacon of light within our communities, to, to trudge, to lead people forward. Is that a part of our lead? Like, are we being cognizant? Are we, if, you, if we're working in those environments, are we masking up every day? Are we making sure that we're, you know, making sure we're clean hands? Are we sharing with other people? Are we getting tested consistently if we're not going to be vaccinated, but also understanding the counts that come with those tests. And, you know, there's, if you're not going to be vaccinated, there's a lot more information you need to know and you need to be, hold yourself accountable and responsible for it. Fine, that's fine, but be responsible. You, all right, you, she, he's he's like heavily <laughs> contemplating. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, you, all right, all right. Yeah, so that's why, that's why she gets paid the big bucks. Because <laughs> I, as you were saying, I was I was trying to come up, you know, with, and you made. I mean, you made a valid point. You you absolutely made a valid point. You you're going to be in that situation anyway, uh, if you don't take the vaccine and then you end up in a situation where you're fighting for your life and you end up in the hospital. Uh, Hope Suzanne brought up a good point in the chat. She said mm -hmm. she did. cases, yeah, exactly. those invasive type testing that they're doing on you is going to probably ultimately kill you anyway. Um, exactly. You know, you know, you know so mm. that, you know, and when it comes down to our life and we're at that, that, and that goes to your point, Dr. Brooke, in regards to our mentality as a culture, in regards to our relation to the healthcare system, whereas we choose to go to the emergency room, where have we just did preventive medicine and just go to our primary care doctor, it only cost us $20, $40 max, right? But our mentality is so screwed up, you know, we we, we do more disadvantage to ourselves than, than advantage to ourselves. Then that goes into PTSD, post-traumatic. Yeah, so exactly, exactly. That's exactly why stuff. mental health is important. Everybody should have a therapist or a social worker or yes. some support group environment in which yes. they are discussing the things that plague them on a day-to-day -day basis. No thing is too small or too big, and it all needs to be addressed. Yes, it does. We are big proponents on this platform of mental health and counseling for our communities, uh, communities of color in general, but specifically Black folks, too, because we are the most traumatized, the most hurt, the most... Uh, damaged uh, in this country because of our social, economical, and political positions. And, you know, I'm a, like, I, we've had many, we had a few uh, of my colleagues who are on here who are therapists and counselors um, around the nation. And yeah, you're right. That play, this all plays into part of the whole, whole the totality and holistic health that you're talking about. But, and, and that's where the crux is. That's, that's, that's really where we're at because. And I'm going to go ahead. Sorry, that, that just goes into, again, intersectionality, all of these things playing a role together. And then not just intersectionality within healthcare. We've got to look beyond the healthcare system and look right. at what we're doing to our economy. Right. Like we are, we are trying it, y'all, trying it. It's, it's, it's like we saw, it's like we didn't, we, 2021 might have started a little too good because it's like we forgot what happened last year, like mm -hmm. how it ravaged industries, how there were shortages on so many different fronts, not just because there wasn't workforce, but how this is affecting policies, how it's affecting um, operational budgets across mm -hmm. uh, companies and whether or not, you, do we really think that if this Delta variant, which is way more infective than um, the uh, alpha variant, do we really believe that our economy could go through another year of shutdowns and surviving that hit mm. of, you know, look at that, look at, I tell you one thing, New Orleans ain't gonna be able to do it. We're already, I know for a fact, our mayor is like on pins and needles right now trying to figure out whether or not we're going to have to cancel our festival season, which if you know, festival season here essentially yeah. keeps the city afloat. Yeah. So yeah, we, well. we are, we are very, and knowing we, I just watched uh, this morning where 
when we ran our data this week, it looks as though most of the cases are transplant. It's people come, it's people tr transit, people coming here, not wow. necessarily us, because actually in New Orleans, we have, we're 60, I think 65% vaccinated. So we understand, we want to work. We want to be back out in hospitality. We want to be, you know, out here in the streets, enjoying ourselves. So, I mean, we're really, and then, okay, you got the economy so that takes another hit if we go into shutdowns. Let's not even talk about uh, the school system. Uh, mm -hmm. Scores came out last week, not looking good. It was, it was a wash, it was a wash. Um, and then you got uh, parents already fatigued by the fact that they were mm -hmm. home with their kids for a whole year last year. Is there an expectation to do that again this year? Where's the mental health supports that come with that? And then you have these teachers who thought they had careers that are now leaving education simply because it's too much of a risk. Um, and then on top of that, you got us being ignorant of what's actually happening as far as the virus is concerned, saying that we'll be good and putting more taxing work on our doctors. I mean, y'all, we haven't even hit the precipice of Delta and I can tell you right now, there ain't no beds in Louisiana. Don't come and get sick here. You ain't getting no care. <laughs> like, ain't no beds here. You getting mm -hmm. sent home until you need a ventilator. Wow. Period. So, and that's not in one health system. That's in all, across all the health systems. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's not worth talking about right now because everybody, we need because you can only focus on so much, right? Right. So you start throwing too much information at y'all, we become ignorant to everything. Yeah. So right now the focus is on vaccines, but if you go and look at what's actually happening with infection right now, you, I mean, what do we have? 1,700 cases yesterday in Louisiana alone? Yeah, I heard Louisiana is one of the, uh, one of the states that the, uh, the cases are going up. Louisiana, Missouri, Texas, Nevada, and yep. somewhere else. As a state. And, yeah. And so, I mean, there's just, there's so many factors that go into this. And so I encourage, the one thing that I do want to push you all, everyone to think about is our health professionals and what message we're sending them by continuing to not move forward with vaccination, by continuing to not, if you're not vaccinated, by continuing to not practice self-discipline and you're in choosing not to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And that's the fact that they've already been through a year of this trauma, right? We talk about systemic trauma. When you go to the hospital and you have an option between a white doctor and a black doctor, are you not the first person to be like, let me get the black doctor, right? So are black doctors treating predominantly who's, who's, who's dying most from this? Black people. So are black doctors in hospitals watching our black people die every day at a rate that they don't have to? Um, and then you have the warehouse patients that last year, because, you know, they were essentially only providing care for uh, COVID for a, a good bit of time. You have patients that have had conditions that have become exasperated over a year's time that would have been previously treatable that are no longer treatable. So now you're watching people die that didn't need to die and you can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. We have to be we have to think about the traumas that we are by by in being self by selfishly interacting with the system. We are making the decisions for our black doctors about their mental health. We are saying we don't give a fuck. Excuse me. But yes, we're saying we don't care. Mm -hmm. We're saying that. I mean, what if the doctors decided in the same way that we have the option of not doing our best? What if they decided not to do their best? What if they decided that last year was enough? Deuces. Yeah. They don't have that option, but we would be SOL and we're the most effective. So I, it, it's, a, it's, it's all connected and we really have to think about how we prioritize and amplify our own PTSD in these moments. If we're doing what we need to do to address our traumas with the system, or are we are we just trying to have them be pervasive, or are we actually educating ourselves and trying to reframe our thoughts around it? And what are we doing to support our and our our medical providers and the people that we're asking to occupy these spaces for us? Okay, all right. 
you valid point, valid point. Mm -hmm. But all right, yes, 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 be fair and balanced. And I hate that term. Um, in, in, in light of how it's been, uh, um, uh, taken advantage of, so to speak, when I say fair and balanced, right? Because I genuinely mean it, but other people use it in other contexts. Okay, okay so I, 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 your point, Dr. Brook, Brook was on point, but is it fair? Is it fair? Because the reality is the reality is reality, right? People don't want to be sick. There's this thing that we have as far as human nature and self-preservation. So no one wants to die. Let's be honest with that. I don't think anybody just wants to die. I don't think anybody would just, I really don't think, I mean, if they had the choice whether to live or die, I don't think anybody would choose to die. Mm -hmm. Can we agree on that? We agree on that. Okay. Mm. So, if we are honest and we're fair and we look at this thing, people are literally, and when I say people, I mean people of color, blacks. We have to think about the reality of the fact that people are literally willing to put themselves in these conditions, whereas not to take a virus that could potentially help them. They would rather wait until they're affected to go under a procedure in the hospital they, they would rather wait. A populist, we're talking about how many people are not taking the vaccines. That has to be addressed. That, that, that has to be looked at. Why, where is this coming from? Right, we have well, to look at that. Where, where do you think it comes from? That's what I'm, it, it, it comes from like what we're talking about, the, the post-traumatic slave syndrome, the, the distrust that we have in the healthcare system, the the um, systematic racism that we're dealing with. We're looking at people who don't even want to return to work. They're willing to quit their jobs or get fired than return to work. They'd rather stay home and do the work from home. This is a new study that came out. So, And they're saying that this is a lot of people of color who don't want to return to the job. So we have to look at the country that we're looking at, and there has to be some type of ownership or responsibility put on the people who pretty much introduced this atrocity and have been producing this atrocity and continuing to do it through systematic racism. Understood. Understood. Right? So, so, I mean, I guess the point I'm trying to make is this, you're absolutely right. You're better off taking the vaccine and not taking the vaccine. But if that's the reality and people are still willing and still have a distrust against that, that has to be addressed in some kind of, there has to be some ownership. Like for example, you mentioned like the vaccine, it takes a, it takes time for the vaccine to work, right? It takes time for testing to be done. You, we can't expect the vaccine to be perfect and not have any problems overnight. Well, then why are people of color or black people expected to trust a system that has been doing them wrong overnight? Why, why are we shoving the pill in their throat? You're not, that isn't the expectation. That isn't it. The expectation is that you inform yourself and you open yourself to the resources and the information out there that could change your perception. It's not, that's why I'm saying it's on both of us. It's on the system and it's on us as individuals to educate, to expose ourselves to environments, to ask questions and to not just put the wall up and say, I'm not doing it. Like you, that's, that's the difference. I mean, I, yes, you're right. The PTSD does exist. Yes. It's, it's not that it's unfounded. We know you can acknowledge history. You can be accepting of it, but you can also choose to change your behaviors and how you interact with it moving forward. I mean, I'm a black woman working in, working in research. How many, how many tables do you think I sit at where there's someone that looks like me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't happen, but mm -hmm. You know what, what was most important, even though I'm on the day, I'm a data scientist now, I don't do any really front facing front, front facing patient work, but I always wanted to stay and and volunteer and do do things for the program within the clinic because I wanted them to see that there was someone on the team that looks like them. I wanted them to know that there's someone advocating for them, that they can come and talk to. And these people exist within these settings. It's just about asking the right questions. It's about not shutting down, not getting angry when you don't hear what you need to hear. Okay, mm -hmm. they said something you didn't like. It triggered something in you. Mm -hmm. Think about what the trigger was. That's why I say we have to really debunk what our interaction is with the trauma. Yeah. It's not, we can't just blanket it and say it's the same for everybody because it isn't. Right, right. And and, and, that, and that goes into, uh, Brooke, in reference to what we talked about before on previous podcasts and in personally, you know, like 
you know, this has been a very traumatic experience for all of us involved in this COVID. And we have all experienced it at various levels. But until, like, and, and me and Kylie have talked about this, until you begin to address your own emotional issues, not only in your personal life, but in your community, you know, your social aspect, and then this, and in this nation that we call America, then it's going to be very hard pressed and challenging for a lot of people to express that on an individual basis to to their to their physician, their their, their medical practitioner, to say, I'm feeling this way, and and also to be able to recognize that I will actually be heard. Hence, why you say you're in those spaces, advocating not only for yourself but for the community. Say, hey, I'm not saying my my perspective is the only perspective, but please think about this in reference of my people, people of color in general, this community per se. You know, and yeah. I and I think that's what the 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 message you're trying to send to us on this podcast and everyone else is like: take the initiative. We have better resources. We're in 2021. Yes, there are some things that are very similar to 1821, 1921. Yeah. But remember, we're still in, we're in 2021. Use it. <laughs> Use it. And believe that the push that our, our ancestors and those that came before us made to put us in these places, to occupy these spaces, you need to start trusting us. Don't put me in the same box as Joe Schmo that started the Texas, I mean, the, the Tuskegee experiment. Right. They ain't the same. Right. Don't treat me like that. Don't make me have to prove to you things like I can't teach you 10 years of research experience, but I can tell you what I do know and give you the resources that might further affirm those things. But what I'm not going to do is sit here and act like I need to educate you and give you the same education that I paid thousands of dollars for. And like time. Not, and time. The time, the, time. The, 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 the sweat equity you have put in and other folks of color in these positions have put in. You cannot, I cannot just sum that up for you. You're going to have to do no. your work, bro. Yeah. You're going to have to do your work. Sis. And, and you, you work. And, and, in, and in expecting that, that's trauma that we are imparting on our own selves and reinforcing and reigniting within our communities of distrust of our own people. So, like, distrust I mean, of self. Distrust of self. Yes. That's a whole nother topic, y'all. That's a whole nother oh. issue. Oh, <laughs> Lord, I'm getting happy. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Oh. That's, that's, yes. that, I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, valid <laughs> points. Val we got to do a part two. We got to do a oh, part two with Doctor Book. We definitely. Yeah, I, I have really so enjoyed this today. I really have. <laughs> I really have. Good. That's We've it. enjoyed having you. We yes, enjoy having you. Definitely. Did. Uh, you, 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 you rebutted a lot of my arguments, and I think a lot of the information that you shared, Doctor Book, for a lot of people listening, um, is really going to give them something to digest and really something to think about. Um, one of the things I really want to emphasize real quick is we, we definitely have to take the responsibility. And like you said, therapy, Cal talks about this all the time. Uh, I don't think I we take you. Really I'm family. I'm, I'm in it right now. You know, so I'm, I'm an advocate I, for it. I pay my pet therapy. Exactly. I'm, 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 I'll put two hands up for it because that lady, that lady done saved my life a couple of times. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so with that said, just do our closing remarks. I know Dr. Brooke had a busy day, probably That's busy yes, day. It's yes, been two indeed. hours. She gave us two hours, y'all. Yes, y'all. Yes, y'all. So yes. Yo, I have nothing. I just want to say thank y'all for listening. Appreciate y'all. Uh, we're gonna do a part two. We're gonna talk about more of this with Dr. Brooke. I'm looking forward to our next one. Um, yes. those are my closing remarks. You can find us on uh, you know, on our you know where y'all we on subscribe, like, you know where we are on subscribe. social media, YouTube. Subscribe That's my closing YouTube. remarks. Kyle, do your closing marks and then give yes. your finals to, to Dr. Brooke to let us know where they can reach you, where your contact information is, all this, because I'm sure after they see this, they're going to have a lot of questions for you. So just be ready for that. But Kyle and then Brooke, please close us out. Yes. So family, thank you for watching. Thank you for spending time with us on this uh, glorious day. Uh, we appreciate your, your time, your questions. Thank you for the questions. Uh, we definitely appreciate Dr. Dr. Brooke White coming in and speaking with us and sharing her expertise and skill on this very um, uh, challenging and uh, debatable and sometimes highly <laughs> argumentable topic, you know. Um, but you can reach us on YouTube, Grand Rise Collective uh, Podcast. Subscribe, y'all. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. You get a lot of views, but y'all got to subscribe, all right? So that way you know what's coming up. Uh, on here on the Facebook, you know, the Facebook group. 
apply to that. We got a lot of things coming for you. We're working on some things, developing some things as far as some exclusive groups. So please do that. We're on Instagram, Grand Rise Collective, right? So again, go to those sources. But without further ado, Dr. Book, could you uh, give us your information? For sure. Yes. So thank you all for uh, joining me in some educational banter today. It's <laughs> yeah. a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, and I hope that the information I shared resonates. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free. You can reach out to me uh, via my Instagram profile, B underscore E-L-L-Z, um, as well as uh, our, the Black, my Black, excuse me, women-led Black activist group here in New Orleans at Black to the Table. We are on Instagram as well as uh, Facebook. We have a YouTube as well. Um, and then if you are interested in holistic remedies, I very much encourage you to check out the Green Tea Collective. You can visit thegreenteacollective.com as well as follow us on Instagram. Yes, indeed. Yes. I will be checking out that green tea. I'm a teacher. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> indeed, you. Indeed, <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Brooke. Well, I appreciate you so much uh, again for your time and, um, you know, all the information that you gave us to give us something to really digest, healthfully digest, you know. And please feel free if there's any questions or you would like to fact check anything that I've shared today. Uh, I can definitely share the resources. Um, so that's, yeah. Fantastic. Indeed, family. Do your research, family. Again, this is our, our thoughts and opinions that we're sharing our experience, but always do your own research. Always. So we're going to do the three, two, one. Do our peace sign on the count of right now. Three, two, one. Peace.